couple of classes with me at the lit at the yeah which at that point was still called uh something like the writers association of greater cleveland so a writers poet, league of greater poet, cleveland. poets and writers league of greater cleveland that was it yeah yeah and yeah. then they shortened the name <laughs> you, you were an excellent teacher i really enjoyed oh, thank you thank class. you so much yeah we you know that's where i met i met my husband there and because he was living in Cleveland at the time when I was teaching at the College of Worcester. And uh, uh, so that year that we lived in Cleveland, I would have been perfectly happy to stay in Cleveland. I, I liked it, actually. Uh, but then we we uh, uh, we got a wild hair and moved back to my hometown, <laughs> which has worked out quite well, you know. But I miss well, I, I, very... I, miss, I, I was back in Cleveland once or twice after that, but uh, it's been a while, so. Well, I, I'm in North Carolina now. I'm, I'm in Wilmington, which is a, a coastal area. Yeah. Um, but we've been down here about four years. Okay, great. And, and Cleveland's a very active um, literary scene. Yeah, 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 wow. <laughs> oh. Hi, Joyce. Hi, Lynn. Yeah, we still have people joining, so I let us uh, go a little bit over, uh, Lynn and Carolyn, just so that we make sure we let everybody come in. Oh yeah, now are you you you're having to do an admitting thing? You're doing that to it's keep just, up. Yep. So it's just a little waiting room. It's real simple, and I will mind yeah. that. I do have us recording, and we will get started. I think in another minute, it we're probably okay, safe, great. and I'll okay. just continue with the waiting room. And then also just to let everybody know, if you do want to read, you can just send me a message via the chat and I will mind that. And I also will, you know, we'll call for people who want to read at the very end. Um, feel free in the chat section to uh, comment on any poems or um, phrases that stick with you, because I will be sending the chat section to both Lynn and Carolyn or Lilith and you, Lean. Um, uh, yes. So that they yeah. can see, they can see. Yeah, no, I was just realizing I really do want to mention that, um, <laughs> and that way people. You know, it's really important as poets um, when we have a new book coming out or connecting with each other. We know that Zoom is not ideal, but I am so incredibly grateful for it. This has been a mainstay uh, mm. for my week, and um, one of the ways that I think we can connect more deeply is through the chat section because then it's it real time responses because it's hard as a poet to read anyway but to read to a screen and oftentimes when I spotlight you all you see is your own face and I don't know if other people find that as jarring as I do but this way in the chat section they see yes we're here and we are responding you just can't hear us because we're on mute <laughs> so that you don't hear kids and cats and dogs in the background um, but yeah. I think we'll go ahead and get started. That's my sense that we're heading into where I'm not seeing as many people in the waiting room. I do want to point out that um, Lynn has a book, the newest book, The Minor Virtues, and you have it in the background that maybe somebody can see that that's perfect. Thank you. And I did want to send you to her website. Is that the best way to get the book, Lynn? Well, the best way is actually through Amazon. Okay. Unless you're local to where I am, it's in a bookstore, but it, it, but Amazon's the, the easiest way. Thank you for asking. Perfect. And and Carolyn, I may have lost you. There you are. No, um, I, I, I just had to go. Uh, let's see, where did I go? I have to turn my video back on. There I am. Yeah, let me see if I can. Oh, there you go. You got it. I see you now. <laughs> There's that beautiful I woman. Go keep my so I'm grateful coffee. to Carolyn <laughs> for coming up with this idea of poets and their alter egos. Yes. I was very fortunate enough to be in Whidbey Island and to also, as John said, learn from an amazing teacher. And um, that's when I first became very obsessed with Eulene and all <laughs> that she has to say. And so um, when she approached me with this idea, she said, I also have someone else that we can invite. So we're in for a real treat, two master poets talking about alter egos. And I really love the questions. I, I put their bios in the um, chat section. And I did want to mention the, um, this dream, the world new and selected poems by Carolyn Wright. That's another one I would really highly suggest getting. Um, but when we talk about how much of the poet's alter ego is fictional, how much is real? So these are the questions we begin with as we just turn it over to Carolyn and Lynn. <laughs> okay. 
Um, let's see, did, did we decide who goes first, Lynn? <laughs> no, we did not, but if, but if you would like to go first, it doesn't matter to me at all. I'm fine with either. Somebody toss a coin. <laughs> I don't have any oh, coins near my me. My friend Lynn <gasps> Levin is a poet who is here, and she is. She and one other poet are reading. Maggie, They're giving Maggie, reading. everybody can hear you. Oh, yep. um, she's a good friend of mine. She's. I'll, I'll mute. <laughs> I just had to find her, <laughs> and there's where the mute button is fantastic because sometimes people don't realize we can hear them. <laughs> Thank you. Lynn. Like, once you said her name, I could find her. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how about if we go alphabetically? Would that work? Yeah, okay. Okay. Awesome. And just a okay. reminder to put your mute button on everybody. Okay. I would that be you lean or would that would that be you lean or would that <laughs> Oh yeah, this is true. <laughs> yeah, is it counting? I'll, I'll go first. It's okay. It's okay. Are we, are we alphabetizing in the Brazilian way, which would be first names by first names or <laughs> <laughs> Did my first name? <laughs> it, it's okay. I'll go first. I'll I'll take the big plunge. <laughs> okay, so, very good. Malika, thank you so much for having us. Happy birthday to you, Carolyn. You are very special to me because you, early on, like these Lilith poems, and you work with me, and you publish some of them in Artful Dodge, and I'm extremely grateful to you. And a warm welcome to everyone during these fraught times. So yeah, my name is Lynn Levin. My newest book is The Minor Virtues. And my alter ego is the mythic or folkloric Lilith, unfairly known <laughs> as a demon of the night, unfairly known. And Lilith's origins are, are very, ancient from the ancient Middle Eastern civilization of Sumer and Akkad. And as time went on, um, mil rabbis in the Middle Ages um, picked, uh, picked her up and interpolated her into some store into some Bible stories, particularly the story of Adam and Eve. So she's not a biblical figure per se, but legends and stories evolved in which imaginative interpretations of the Bible and added on ideas were, were put in there. So and according to this legend, rabbinic legend, Adam had a first wife before Eve and this wife was Lilith. But Adam and Lilith had some problems. Adam always wanted to be on top in bed and Lilith uh, sometimes wanted to be on top in bed and she was assertive um, in uh, various other ways. And so Adam divorced her and she became an evil spirit flying about the universe at night, having sex with men in their sleep and also causing the crib deaths of babies. Now, I and a lot of other people feel that she's been given a bum rap, that her, her reputation is a result of misogynistic attitudes. And I seek to give her compassion and understanding and respect. And I also make her into a very modern woman. So I am going to uh, read I Lilith poems and they're, some of them are in this book, and then some of them are in a previous book, Miss Plastique. So I've got Lilith poems in two books. I'm gonna start off though with a, a limerick, Lilith and Adam. Lilith refused to lie below Adam in their bungalow. At last she fled their frustrating bed, and for better or worse, flew solo. <laughs> and that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> but but I, I will um, expand on this. So she's friends with Eve, no hard feelings there, they're girlfriends. And here they are taking a walk back to Eden. Eve and Lilith back at the garden. Eve and Lilith peered through the padlocked gates of the garden, now a restricted community. Eve glared at Lilith. You told me it was easier to beg forgiveness than ask permission. Now look. That's what I always do, Lilith replied, aware that under the circumstances, she sounded pretty lame. Plus, said Eve, I think I'm pregnant. I told you to use protection, said Lilith, but Adam promised. 
Lilith rolled her eyes. Him and his teaspoon of joy, said Eve. A fault line threatened her brow. Girlfriend, counseled Lilith, either change your life or accept your life, but don't go around mad. Let that anger go, said Lilith, just let it go. Eve hated it when her friend got preachy. Anyhow, when it came to holding on to anger, Eve was an Olympian, a gold medalist. She clung to a grudge like a shipwrecked sailor to a scrap of wood. It had something to do with her excellent memory. As Eve sucked on the red lollipop of her hurt, the two women trudged back to Nod. All of a sudden, something dark waved in the grass. Eek, shrieked Lilith, a snake. She high-stepped in panic. Oh, woman up, thought Eve, as she grabbed a Y-shaped stick, immobilized the critter's head, stared straight into his eyes. The snake looked back at her with a who me look. This one's harmless. It's only a dumb animal, said Eve. Kill it, kill it, shrieked Lilith. Sorry, Fritz, said her friend. No can do. Eve let the snake go. She just let it go. Eve and Lilith go to Macy's. In the fitting room at Macy's, Eve shimmies into a pair of leopard print leggings, then mocks a dance pose. OMG, you're hotter than a habanero in those pants, gasps Lilith. She slides her finger down Eve's shapely hip as though striking a match then blows out her finger. Eve can't believe how good that feels through the cotton polyester spandex blend. Lilith always went for men in a big way, but maybe the oversexed act was overcompensation, a put on. Maybe Lilith is gay. Maybe I'm gay, thinks Eve, wishing her friend would touch her again. In the Macy's fitting room with the triple paneled mirror, the women's figures mingle and multiply. Looking at one of herself, Eve moves her right arm, but in the mirror, it looks like her left arm. She can't be sure which image reflects the real Eve. In the champagne of the moment, she turns to Lilith, the real one, the warm one, intending to bestow upon her an air kiss of gratitude, at most a swooch on the cheek. But Lilith catches Eve's mouth, draws her to her other self. Eve can't remember when she's ever had a kiss like that. Maybe she never has, never will again. So what is the point in stopping? The women linger in each other's arms as the hidden security camera looks on with its mysterious eye. And the women are okay with that. They know that eye sees all things, sees all, says nothing. Lilith at the cosmetics counter. See, Lilith really does like the department stores and stuff like that. Lilith at the cosmetics counter. Lilith's face made a face at her in the lighted mirror at the cosmetics counter. Craggy, ravined, parched. That thing above her neck looked like the Sinai Desert. Yesterday, militants high on toxic rumors. Baby killer, man raper, had run her out of town. Again. She needed some ego first aid. New address, new name, plastic surgery, all that in good time. You look as one who has returned from a long journey. This makeup will help, said the sales lady. She tilted her head toward Lilith as if to say, we're all in this together. Then tried to sign her up for a store credit card. 20% off all first day purchases, including cosmetics. The lady also happened to be missing a front tooth. Her false eyelashes were so thick, she gave everyone the hairy eyeball. She began to fuss with her brushes, probably not clean and pots of color, no doubt contaminated by frequent double dipping. Lilith was about to put herself under the other woman's power when she detected a whiff of sabotage in the jasmine of her perfume. Advice from an old lover tapped Lilith on the shoulder. Never buy makeup from someone who's not as good looking as you. Lilith glanced at the high def mirror. The wilderness of her face looked back at her with weird familiarity. Haggard is good enough for me, she decided. Thanked her saboteur and slid from the chair. She knew her fate was a bitch, but it was her bitch. And that was the beauty of it. Lilith, Lilith's quilt. Older, moon swept no more. 
Lilith saw bed as a place to sleep, but sleep abandoned her like the millions of guys she'd had. Every night she tossed and turned with memories of her god-awful sex life. The lovers who woke up terrified, dumped her out of the sack, mocked her desire. Did a man ever live who could mix with her body and soul? To court slumber, Lilith began to stitch a quilt, a gift for her bed. Each morning she gathered scraps of colorful fabric, appliqued scenes of the good life, families at supper, workers at work, weddings, births, kisses in the park. By afternoon, squares of human happiness spread before her like funnies in the newspaper. Her scenes itched for a little disappointment, but how much disappointment did the good life allow? A setback was the season, a letdown once a week, once a day. Lilith drove herself nuts with self-doubt. Just before bed, she would take a seam ripper to her beautiful squares, then collapse on her sheets. Every morning, same story. Lilith got up craving sleep like caffeine, purple purses under her eyes. She would gather her scraps of colorful cloth and pat her bed. Old friend, she would say, this time I will finish the quilt and then we will sleep like lambs. Lilith the scribe. After the divorce from Adam, Lilith lived as she pleased. She let her hair stream wild as the river reeds. She put on a little weight, but no one carped about her hips and thighs. She took lovers, turned with them on the airy sheets of night, though the hands of day sundered every bond. People couldn't decide whether she was a witch or an enchantress, whether she was to be hated or loved, worshiped or hanged. Loved she was lonely, scorned she was lonely. She took to sitting on a broken column where she spun romances in which man heroes slew giant scorpions and made armor of their chitin, in which woman heroes whacked vipers and made their skins into shoes and handbags. How well she understood the pounding heart, the quaking hand, the cold eye. She shaped bloody deeds into golden legends where justice was served, but only after much chopping and boiling. People who wouldn't invite Lilith to tea gathered around her broken column. They wanted to know more about the armor and the handbags, the mighty who made them, the lives of the rescued. But memory could be as sand. Lilith, the people said, who will tell these tales after you? What of the ears of our children? Lilith knew that she would live for thousands of years, which was a lot of sand down the hourglass and a lot of stories to forget. So she prevailed upon the scribes to teach her how to press her stories into clay. It was a hard sell. Favors had to be traded. After a number of ancient evenings, she found a few scribes who had some respect for reciprocity. And these few were to her as bread and salt. Lilith's tablets piled up surely to be read for all time, but after a couple of centuries, people stopped reading Sumerian. Akkadian was the next big thing, then other tongues and alphabets. Lilith kept up with the changes, wrote on scrolls of papyrus, parchment. In time, her stories appeared in codices, then bound books printed in pa on paper. Oh, paper, sublime invention, solid surface on which a thought might land. Now Lilith finds herself without clay or stylus or quill or typewriter or ballpoint pen, without paper. She sits before a keyboard and screen, all of her imaginings, her hero tales turned into little flicks of light hovering at the mercy of a solar storm. Every so often, Lilith aims to reread what she has written, but who has the time to spend going backwards? All is so horribly fast and new, so much swept away by the broom of time. And I will conclude with, thank you, with Lilith tries online dating. Well past the first blush of feminine decline, centuries past in fact, yet looking only 62, retired from the night shift and thirsting for comfort, consolation, Lilith considers the possibility of long-term companionship. She yearns to be half of an old couple. 
to live with a man tolerating his habits with an annoyance close to affection, trusting that he will endure her with similar warmth. Incessant as the ocean waves, this need laps at her feet. For pity's sake, her latest crop of girlfriends has died or gone to Florida. The road ahead blurs. Arthritis thrusts her gears, rusts her gears. Worst of all, those Pratt falls into the pool of forgetfulness and the attempts to lack them off. So Lilith does what other single women do. She signs up with an online dating service, a Jewish one, an odd choice for one to whom the tradition has been cruel, maligning her as the witch of midnight sex. But the great chain of Jewish being means something to Lilith. She is stubborn that way, even though she knows that there are many fine Gentiles out there and everyone is mixing nowadays. She uploads a fairly recent photo, lists herself as divorced, no children, lies about her age, posts a profile that makes no mention of her lusty past, no clue that her fountain has run dry. Soon the flirts, the looks, the messages pour in. Hope begins to peck its way out of its tough shell. She feels like a woman again. And this is how it unfolds. First date, coffee, during which the fellow goes on about himself. Second date, pizza. Here, various warning lights flash on the get to know you dashboard. But these Lilith chooses to ignore. Third date, dinner, following which the guy requests sex or a timeline for same. I'm a guy, Steve or Jeff says, his denim brushing up against her. But as soon as she tells Steve or Jeff that she doesn't want to rush, it's goodbye and good luck. Lilith knows that a man's desire surges, but his days are few. She, on the other hand, will live for generations. She prays, not really believing in divine intervention, that in a generation to come, a man might invite her for a third date, demanding nothing. A fourth date, demanding nothing. A fifth, requesting the same nothing. Finally, out of gratitude and relief and a sense of being understood, she will fall into his arms. He will comfort and console her and she will comfort and console him. And then perhaps the fountain play again in the desert of all those years. Thank you for listening. Thank you. People can unmute. I know people want to. Feel free to unmute and let her. Oh, thank things, you. you know. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank I you. had a quick question. Excellent. When did you first start writing about Lilith? Um, a good 15 years ago, maybe. I, I actually learned about her at a, at a literary conference with one of the people did a presentation on her and he, he was kept talking about Lilith. I said, who is this Lilith? So I read up about her and learned about her and then I started making my own interpretations of her. Awesome. And a lot of people wrote compliments that I'll be sending to you, but oh, um, people were saying how much they really enjoyed the modernization. Yeah. As Susanna said, love the modernization and your sense of humor was fantastic. And <laughs> lots of lines, uh, people were quoting, Haggard is good enough for me. That was Eulene. Eulene really liked that. <laughs> of course, that. Eulene had Eulene. something to say about that. Oh, <laughs> uh, it was just wonderful. <laughs> thank you so thank very you. much. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Her modernization was so timely. Yeah. All you missed was the election. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and everything else. Yeah. Well, well there's that um, computer thing going on. <laughs> <laughs> I I think I, I want to hear, I I would request, Eulene would request uh, Lilith's poem in which she's um struggling with Google Translate to uh, <laughs> translate uh, Sumerian into Akkadian, you know? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Idea. Yeah. A go yeah, Google Translate should surely have that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it had a little cuneiform or something. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. That would, be, that would be a lot of fun. <laughs> well, I... 
I also want, you know, like, I think it's important you will have questions now that we allow that time, you know, because mm -hmm. I don't want anybody to forget a question that they might have for Lynn. Or for Lilith, y'all can ask directly <laughs> Lilith too. But. Lynn, will you be writing more Lilith poems? Um, you know, Marilyn, I, I might. I, I've been writing them over a period of years. And so, um, yeah, I think I will. And, and that, that's a, a good goal for me. Good. Go good. With that. Thank you. It definitely felt like uh, listening to a friend that I would want to know or somebody I would want to know. Right. Enjoyed that aspect, really did. Yeah, you, you, you. you have to be careful with these characters these alter egos, when they come into being, um, they start becoming, you know, like fan fiction where, you know, mm. the, the very popular author has died. So new people start writing those books and uh, just because mm -hmm. they love the story and they want it to continue. And you never know, this may start happening with Lilith, you know? <laughs> yeah, it could start something. Has she, has she yet been to uh been to rabbinical school or become a rabbi or or uh you know um actually <laughs> she, she she hasn't but i did recently publish a story called frida and her golem and frida is a rabbinical student <laughs> so right. we do have that in there mm -hmm. but uh yeah well Ooh, uh, lilith at the star i was, I was wondering Thank you. <laughs> i was wondering lynn whether whether you you got uh energy out of your titles because your titles are wonderful yes, uh, and, you know you you put you, you put Lilith and Eve in a cosmetic uh, department store <laughs> and anything can happen yeah uh, it's uh, quite wonderful well, what and, you did. yes I, and I love some of the images and how sometimes we're seeing from their eyes or we're seeing them from an outer perspective it was it was really enjoyable to hear the different ways of looking at what was going on within the poems. Thank you. Well, you know, thanks. I, you know, Greg, in answer to your question, your, your comment, I am, there are verbs in a lot of these titles. Yeah. Even Lilith go to Macy's or, um, you know, Lilith tries online dating. So sometimes the, the verb in there helps me like jump off into a little narrative. So thank you for- The saying. verb. A verb, yes. <laughs> Verbs do it. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, there was a bit. Go ahead. I, I was going to point out that Belinda just said there was a feminist mag magazine called Lilith. Yes. Um, yeah. And, you know, she said true modern midrash, definitely true. Mazel Tov and much success. And that's Belinda from the Abington Library Daytime Book Group. Oh, Belinda. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank great. you. Yeah, the, I, I, um, I, I have had a poem in, Lil, in Lilith magazine, but it wasn't any of my Lilith poems. It was a different <laughs> well, one. Uh, well, yeah. that's, that's got to be corrected soon. <laughs> yeah. Says Euline. I like that Lilith at Starbucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, Lilith has got to just demand a place in that magazine, you know, I mean. <laughs> I know, what's wrong with that? Yeah, I'll, have to, I'll make more. I'll make more and I'll submit. And thank you. That's an excellent suggestion. And uh, I wanted to hold up. To, uh, this is this is not this this does not have to do with the Day of the Dead, uh, but it is kind of skeletal. I'll turn it sideways. These images are very odd. And then there's the weird light on the screen. But this is Artful Dodge. Um, the cover, it, it's got that smooth cover, so it's glowing and it's glowing with the TV. But this this has a uh, one of the Lilith, Lilith the scribe is in this issue. So uh, yeah, there it is. I'll hold Thank it up. Thank you for publishing that, Carolyn. Yeah, and you have it, right? You have you have copies. Yes. Okay, good. Excellent. And it was a great issue. It had a lot of good interviews and, and poems and all kinds of stuff in there. Yeah. And so. so when was that put out, Carolyn? When did that come out, Lynn? Artful Dodge? Uh, this issue appeared uh, earlier this year. Uh, it's 54 and 55. And uh, the publication date, I think the, I th oh, it's, it's uh, 2019, but I think, uh, I think Dan Bourne, the editor sent me a big box full uh, in about March, something like that. So 
just in time for COVID. <laughs> <laughs> right? So. Yeah, if you do the Lilith at Starbucks, you can do pre-COVID and post-COVID. <laughs> yeah, right. We had a whole bunch of COVID and Lilith. Mm. Oh, there's so much to talk about now. Oh, don't, don't get me started. But let's, <laughs> let's hear about Yulene. Yeah, oh, well, all right. Yulene will be happy to oblige. We are Just spotlighting keep, Yulene. Keeping, keeping there caffeinated there. Okay, very good. Okay. And and you can see that that Yulene went full leopard here. Uh, <laughs> we love she it. does that occasionally. It kind of props up the attitude. All right. Okay. So we've all been talking about insomnia and all of the uh, you know, sort of industrial industrial scale nail biting and everybody on edge in the last several days here. And this is something indeed that we all understand. So <clears throat> Yulene, who is my alter ego, or uh, I used to be, I used to be, uh, or Yulene used to be my alter ego, but now as I, as I always say, Yulene has instructed me carefully to say this, that I am now a holographic projection of Yulene. So, you know, I take no responsibility <laughs> for what Yulene says, and Yulene takes no prisoners, as uh, she wrote in that little intro to the reading. But I was just telling uh, Greg Janikian, uh, whom I have known since graduate school, and that totally carbon dates both of us, but uh, <laughs> um, that Yulene was first born uh, out of the forehead of Zeus, as it were, on the sofa in this very weird, funky apartment I was living in back in the fall of, oh, I'm not going to say what year, <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, it was a very uncomfortable night of practically no sleep. So that was how Yulene came about. So let's hear a poem about sleeplessness Yulene style, which has an epigraph from the poet Marvin Bell. You may probably all have heard of Marvin Bell, uh, who also is a poet who uh, experiences a great deal of insomnia. And the epigraph is, knowing I couldn't sleep made it harder to try. Yulene tries anyway, even though insomnia gallops like apocalyptic thoroughbreds in her DNA. And her parents' joke motto writes 24 seven, somebody is always up, is so tediously true that nobody has laughed for years. Now she lies in the dark with the phone unplugged and photos of long dead pets turned to the wall. She switches on her miniature Chinese fountain for good feng shui. Her boyfriend, Al, the family's backslidden Buddhist, tells her it's really to circulate the chi. But with his Mr. Clean coiffure, he's got to split hairs whatever way he can. And when has Yulene done anything for the right reasons? The gurgle of perfumed water by the bed does nothing to power down her mind, but it does rev up like sympathetic magic, the PP production centers in her brain. She tries counting breaths, inhale and exhale like sheep just shorn, the flock rasping back and forth through the wheezy gates of the sheepfold. But the metaphor takes over. The sheep bleat, sheep dogs circle them and bark, and kindly vets with battered leather bags and North Country brogues descend from their square black packards and trudge toward the paddock, as in James Harriet's Yorkshire between the wars. But then the metaphor goes poof, and Yulene snaps awake in the diminishing dark, her overactive imagination defeating the purpose of her method. What to do? Yulene's not so sanguine. 
the latest wars still on, but she's not one of those bleary eyed patriot prodigals who has vowed never to sleep till it's over. She simply lies there while pre-dawn light creeps like a feral cat through the shrubbery as newly fledged juncos twitter unawares and tohees mew in leaf litter, litter under the rhododendrons. She wonders, how would you feel if you believed in sleep as much as I do in peace, but you can't find a way to achieve either? In the war of jangled nerves, Yulene is losing both sides of the conflict. Okay, that's Yulene. Now, now to wake up a little bit. Um, you know, we all we all go through those uh, fun rituals of of reenactment called reunions, right? High school reunions, college reunions. And you leans, uh, one of you leans uh, reunions suddenly found itself all tangled up with uh, memories of of earlier um, not a crook presidencies. So uh, <laughs> that's what you're going to hear now. And this is one of those poems that is um, it is an A.B. Sedarian. So you know the first the first line begins with A. And then the last three are X, Y, and Z. And those are always the fun ones to write, um, in English anyway. And so uh, as you'll see, I think you'll recognize some of the allusions in here. So this was Eulene. Oh, there was an important reunion that she had to miss. Uh, and so she wrote this as some form of poetic justice, right? Or maybe it was revenge, but here it is. <laughs> Euline at the umpteenth reunion. <laughs> After all those wild weekends, roller coaster rides, brandishing our six flags, six packs through the nerdy kids' noetic nights, crammed with lotus stemmed stupefaction and hempen high alerts, calling ourselves the unruly cool and dope slapping each other like iconoclastic know-it-alls. Don't you think we would have had a clue? Even when all we could do was check our watches and watch our grade point averages draw tracer fire? Foolishness was fun then, was wisdom from the bee stinged lips of babes who glammed it up for the big men on campus, letter sweatered hunks cruising the hallowed high school hells, halcyon halls where ROTC recruiters barely had a toehold. In a few years, after the football scholarships and NFL drafts, busted knees and torn Achilles tendons, these natural grass juggernauts devolved to slabs of spam in suits at the class reunion, rolling into town in their Silverados to keep up jocular appearances like old scores never settled. They braid like jackasses after a few too many, while their homecoming queen wives, now mousy matrons, cringed mortified at their elbows and plotted Mexican divorces. What about the rest of us newly nattering nabobs? Bureaucrats, poets, drones, and flunk outs with unlucky birth dates, draft picks by the Pentagon for NOM. Only a few million selected themselves out, ashes of their draft cards rising in tidy pyres across the border in Vancouver and Thunder Bay, Winnipeg and Sault Ste. Marie. Quixotic resistors, commie cowards, thundered our not-a-crook commander with his not-so-secret plans for victory concealed between Cambodian crosshairs. Before he embarked on his own road to ruination, 
waving with grin, grinning resignation to the cameras and ascending the mobile staircase of Air Force One, like a self-hanging gallows for the last time. Treasonous target of our days of rage, sequestered and senescent on his fire hazard fortress of a ranch with his unconscionable pardon. We turned our indignation elsewhere, schmoozing and grooving into the vacuous me decades. If we'd known then what we know now, would we have done it differently? Now that we've pre procreated generations X and Y, parenthood, the best revenge for rebels, what have we got to teach them? Aging yuppies, we've got no authority to question but our own. But who among us will go back to Oz and pull aside the curtain? Okay, that's the most uh, barn burning I think you're going to get <laughs> until maybe until sometime in the next couple of weeks. All right, um, I just had a, a wonderful bit of news, which was that two poems of mine from a, a, few, a book that's going to come out next year, or maybe in spring of 2022, I haven't decided. Uh, uh, two of those poems just appeared online today in a publication called Pandemic Publications. And I will send the link uh, at some point here. But <clears throat> this is one of the poems from the book. And it is, a, uh, it is not exactly a Eulene poem, but the character in the poem was interviewed by Eulene. <clears throat> and it was uh, a woman called Ruthie the Duck Lady, <clears throat> who was a character in New Orleans, a, a well-known street character. And here is a postcard of her. I will hold it up. Let's see, can you see her? Let's see, there she is. There she is dressed in her Santa Fe dress in her roller skates. There are her roller skates, you see, and her Santa Fe dress and, and her duck holding her her young duck, because she used to have little flocks of ducks kind of busting ass behind her as she roller skated down the street. So Eulene wanted to learn more about her when Eulene was living in New Orleans for a time. So this is the poem that emerged and it's called Endecasyllabics. Remember that form? Endecasyllabics, 11 syllables to the line, about the women, Ruthie. And it has an epigraph from one of the photographers of this woman whose real name was Ruth Grace Moulin, who lived until 2001. And the, uh, the, the line is, she's not out of touch with reality. She's just not interested. I wanna talk with Ruthie Discover who is this woman inside the duck lady facade, the roller skates, the thrift shop wedding gown and veil, the fuzzy ducklings that parade behind her through the quarters on Mardi Gras. Rumors of burly blue uniformed police watching over her asleep on Jackson Square park benches. I find her in a nameless bar on Dauphine Street plucking at her torn voile skirt and runs in her pilled cotton stockings. She glares when I ask to take her photo. That'll be a dollar. Her drawl is steely, her outstretched fingers ending in carmine painted claws. I falter before her scowl, her desiccated voice, her figure perched on a broken back chair, tough as a folded bird. I hand over the dollar, aim and focus. She sits up straight, grin grimaces for the flash. Then she nods, turns back to her glass with its Jack's Brewery logo. My deeper questions, 
they never had a chance. <laughs> okay, so that was Ruthie. All right, now let's go, since we've just had Halloween, we're gonna do, Yulene uh, has a little Halloween. And then we'll go from there. Uh, this actually was one of the earlier Yulene poems that got committed back in the day. I think that was when I was living in that crazy house. Yes, there uh, next, next to Thorndon Park. Uh, and, oh, what is this signing me out? No, I'm not signed out. Uh, cancel that. Okay, I seem to be telling me I'm canceled out, but that's not true. No, we can hear you. Something is happening here, but uh, don't worry about it. I'm gonna, just gonna stay here. This is Eulene's Halloween. And this was the, the origin of this poem was somebody in one of my graduate seminars used the word shunpiker. And I had never heard that word before, but it meant someone who stayed off the interstates or stayed off the big highways so they wouldn't have to pay the turnpikes, you know, the, the, the tolls on the turnpikes. So they were shunpikers. So that was Euline back in the day. Euline's Halloween. Euline's a shunpiker, but her lovely meanders get less lovely farther down the road and the tolls inflation's geometric on each deviant inch. Take Halloween as a for instance. All the death wish heads were glued like flies to the wallpaper. And Euline got up in sorry and clown white, glided to the graveyard with her household's other wraiths. What could she do there but play tombstone leapfrog and listen to midnight's pumpkin colored shrieks? Her obeisance with folded hands was a posture for no friends. And her best pal, Salvatore, wore Oshkosh overalls, hillbilly slouch, and belch. They'd never match. At home, one plain non-jack-o'-lantern candle spilled 12 threads of wax. It was time to get off the boneyard's muddy tracks. But Salvatore had vanished with a carbon copy, carbon compound wizard and a wraith. Give up that apple bob, Euline. Even in mask and costume, you go home alone. And, and I think when she gets home there, she's got to go find Lilith and call her up and say, girlfriend, this is getting very crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm going to read uh, one more, and I'm going to read it twice, once in English and once in Spanish. And this is the final poem in the book, Mania Klepto, the book of Euline. I will read it first. I think I'll read it first in Spanish, and then, uh, you know, just, just for the heck of it, I'll read it in English. Okay. It's called Euline Declares, or in Spanish, Eulene declara. No soy mujer, soy la fuerza de la naturaleza. No soy una nube de tormenta o la nube embudo del torbellina. Soy una ráfaga de tiros desde el frente de combate. No soy el fuego central, soy una maraña de zarzamoras asiáticas cubriendo el precipicio. No soy el siniestro argumento que se desentraña en el capítulo final de la novela. Soy el último asunto tarjado en, de la lista en tu velador. No soy la constelación del cisne o de la cruz del sur. Soy el grito de los gansos migrando por, por el resplandor invernal de las torres celulares. No soy la luz de tu vida. Soy el eco de generaciones pintado en cuevas. No soy el espejo ni la lámpara. Soy el primer reflejo a lo largo de la cuchilla aserrada del continente. No soy el vuelo transcontinental del exiliado. Soy una brisna de cristal girando por años en el tormento azul verde del derretimiento glacial. 
no soy la hija natural del silencio y del demorado tiempo. Soy la perdida cría de, una, de un saliente inclinado, una miscelánea de campanas estrepitosas. No soy un capricho del tiempo o las vicisitudes del parto. Soy una mujer hecha y derecha. No soy la fuerza de la naturaleza. Soy una mujer. Ok. Yulene declares, I am not a woman. I am a force of nature. I am not a thundercloud or a cloud wall. I am a burst of incoming fire. I am not a fire base. I am a tangle of Himalayan blackberries covering the headland. I am not a dark plot to disentangle in the novel's final chapter. I am the last task crossed off the list on your nightstand. I am not the constellation of Cygnus or the Cruz del Sur. I am the cry of geese migrating by the wintry glow of cell towers. I am not the light of your life. I am the echo of generations painted on cave walls. I am not the mirror or the lamp. I am the first gleam along the continent's serrated blade. I am not the exile's transcontinental flight. I am a crystal chip swirling for years into the blue-green torment of glacial melt. I am not the natural child of silence and slow time. I am the lost offspring of a tilting shelf, a miscellany of obstreperous bells. I am not a whim of weather or the vicissitudes of birth. I am a woman straight and strong. I am not a force of nature. I am a woman. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you leave. Oh, that is you. a perfect poem to end on. That, that is beautiful. Fabulous. Bravo, Carolina. Sí. <laughs> Gracias. I, I was wondering how you were going to translate Una Mujer Hecha y Derecha. This is Belinda speaking. I'm a, a native Spanish speaker. Ah, Beautiful. que bueno, que bueno. Encantada. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll mute myself now. Yes, indeed. So, oh, wow. Somebody has a thing in the chat about Shunpike being yeah. the airport service. How amazing. Belinda <laughs> <laughs> said that there was a small family-run transportation service um, to the airport, it was called a shun pipe. And I had never heard that term either. So that was an interesting detail that she now has insight into the name no, of I have it. Yeah, I, I have to say, I apologize. I, I couldn't get my picture in. I'm, I'm working on my phone uh, this evening. Um, I, the, the family was Irish and uh, some of them were just arriving in the country. This was maybe 25, 30 years ago. And I just assume it was some kind of an Irish name or an Irish word. So I am so enlightened at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, you lean totally fell in love with that word. So yeah. But, uh, uh, my no, father was a shun piker. I <laughs> wish he was alive so that I could tell him there was a term for what he did. <laughs> There's a yeah, name it, for it's, that. There, it's wonderful to find a, uh, you know, you just have to use these words somehow. So you write a poem to, you know, insert them. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Carolyn. It was great to hear, you know, more Eulean poems in a row. And I know um, you're, you'll get a copy of this chat section, but a lot of people were saying the reunion ABC Darien was just fantastic. Hysterical. Yeah, <laughs> we have all, we have all suffered those reunions. <laughs> That's why I don't go anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and then I also really love that a couple people were um, saying that Yulene is skilled at alliteration. There were several that were just brilliant. They were wonderful. And the, um, the musicality and the language was just so, it was, it felt to me like there's a texture sometimes with words and it was just lovely to hear uh, such well-textured words together. 
Um, Carol is saying that she has Thank to go. You. She said, I have really enjoyed Lilith and Eulene. There could not be a better way to spend the early evening. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Carol. We'll see, we'll see you uh, again very soon. Yes. <laughs> thank you all. Yeah, this so was great. So if people uh, have any questions, feel free to jump in. I know we're really close to time, but I, I do want to be mindful that, you know, there might be some questions that you have for Eulene or for Lilith. What do you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, uh, Carolyn, um, whether uh, do you do you write in Spanish at all and then translate to English, or is it always the other way around? Well, actually, to make a confession, and Eulene does make confessions, but she tells only lies in her confessions. <laughs> um, <laughs> That, that poem was actually written, all of the imagery in that poem is pretty much from Chile because the poem got committed in Chile in my friend Eugenia Toledo's, um, she and her husband own a, a, a flat, an apartment on one of the higher floors of this high rise uh, building overlooking the uh, national, the Chilean, National Railway Museum, which used to be a roundhouse where Pablo Neruda's father worked as uh, an engineer or motorista as, they, as he was called. I think what he did was, you know, when the, when the locomotives and cars were brought in for repair, mm -hmm. uh, they did all the repair work on them. And now it's a railway museum. And uh, Eulene was looking down at night, looking down upon that museum, which had a few lights on at night, even though it was closed. And suddenly she began writing this and she was writing it in Spanish. Mm. So mm. later on, she kind of laboriously translated it with the help of Eugenia, whose first language is Spanish, <laughs> translated <laughs> it to English, something like that. So yeah, I, I occasionally write in Spanish and more recently um, Portuguese. <laughs> mm. But that's a whole other story. Uh, Eulene has not yet um, committed any poems in Portuguese, but Carolyn has, so, but that's a whole other story, yeah, so yeah. Good question. Well, I have thoroughly enjoyed this, and I know everyone else has as well, and I was thinking, what would happen if Eulene and Lilith, uh, you know, wrote a poem together? <laughs> yeah, mm, yeah I was just thinking. Let's do it. It's done. Yeah. It's a date. We'll do yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> because I can see the real simpatico where both of them would urge the other one to, yeah, sure, go for it, say it. <laughs> I, I think I think it would have to be in a in a um, a department store dressing room with all the mirrors. Yeah. Okay. Something like that. We'll we'll work on this. We'll work on this. Let's yeah, I love it. And, we can and do a collaborative do poem. And That's we're going to take this show on the road, although they're probably going to be virtual roads, not virtuous roads, but virtual <laughs> roads. Uh, we're already, we are already plotting a few other uh, Eulene and Lilith happenings. And, yes. and that, yes, will be, that will be fun. <laughs> that oh, that's awesome. Wonderful. I'm glad you're doing that. That's fabulous. Uh, I enjoyed seeing both of you. Yes, um, great. Likewise. Yeah. So near yet so far, Greg. I yeah. know. Um, um, we should, we should, now, Greg, did you, uh, did I have the correct email for you? I don't know. I sent you an email about an hour or so before the reading. So. Oh, I didn't receive it. Okay. It was the upen.edu email? It, yes. Yes. There is yeah. that, but but there's another one you can do Gregory Janikian at gmail.com as well. Oh, okay. Just Gregory Janikian, one word, or is there yes, a Yes, that's it. One word. Okay. One word. Oh, that's great. Yes. Yes. If you know how to spell it. <laughs> I know how to spell it. I do know how to spell it. <laughs> you would definitely have to do the spelling on that one. Spell check's yeah. not going to fill it in for you. Okay. Well, I wanted to thank everybody for being here um, for my 55th birthday party that I chose to have this wonderful celebration and got lucky. Oh, happy birthday. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy, happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Y'all can actually sing. That's awesome. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> 
But y'all have made my night. Everyone. And thank you. It's been my pleasure. Thank y'all so very much. It was great to see so many faces here and um, to hear Lilith and Euline and Carolyn and Lynn read. Yes. And Carolyn, I did uh, want to say also, where would you prefer people to buy your books? Is there a website we should send them to? Um, the, the, this book, The Mania Klepto, the book of Euline, the best place to get that is actually from the publisher which okay. is Turning Point Books. I only have like half a dozen left. Although if somebody wanted one with a signature, uh, you could get them. The publisher, you know, it's that thing where they, it's not out of print because they, they, they do print on demand. So it always exists. But the other one, um, This Dream the World, you can get that from me because I have it. And, and uh, Lilith, uh, I want to get some of Lilith clay tablets. I want the sans serif cuneiform. Oh, okay, the special. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's print no, on demand, right, Lynn? Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. You have to go to the oh, pen museum have some to get great that. Ideas. Yeah. yeah. But you oh, are very busy. Yeah, I, I'll, I, have hi, a question. I, I want to get, I, I would also love to have everybody's emails and just send out an email and thank everybody. And I'm, I'm sure Malika, you have everybody. So that would be great. No, I actually do not. And I see that Janice has a question. So oh, Janice, Janice, yes. Yeah, jump oh, in. Hi. Yeah, um, Carolyn, I have your, your book, the Eileen book. I just um, have misplaced it temporarily. But can you remind me, are there other um, poems with form? Like you said, the Ruthie, the duck lady is in Deca syllabics. And Deca mention, syllabic, yes. Yeah, are there others in form that you could remind me of? And then when I find it, I'll take a look. Um, yeah, uh, the, the end Deca syllabics one is not in a book yet, but it's in, uh, it's in a, uh, a, a magazine called pandemic publications and i am going to uh paste the link into the chat right now and of course uh, janice i have your email so i could mm -hmm. i could send it to you but i'm going to put it in the chat and here's the chat uh so you can see okay. what it looks like mm -hmm. there it is um and the other ones in here uh one of them was an ab sedarian oh i didn't read that one but the the umpteenth reunion one was an A.B. Sedarian. Yeah. Uh, and then the others were not really in form. No, no. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Good night. Good night, Marilyn. Oh, Great to see you. Good night. Thank you. The, uh, the sleeplessness you lean style was in a special form called insomniacs. Okay. We all need more directions on the insomniac form. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> just gonna write that. Just, all right, guys, we're going to conclude. And, and just once again, Lynn and Carolyn, thank you so very much. It was great to see Susanna. And then my co-editor from Redheaded Steptile, Caleb, was here. Oh, wonderful. Um, and a pleasure to see so many new faces. So be well. Be well. Thank, well. thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Malaika. Thank you and so much. We'll see you. Thanks so much. We'll see you again bye. soon. Okay. Bye bye. I, I'll Good be night. in touch with many bye. of you. Bye, okay. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.